Hello, everyone. I'm Ronnie Stidvent, Director of the Center for Politics and Governance. Uh, thank you for joining us for the latest installment of our Page Turner series, uh, where we're welcoming David Frum, the author of Come Back, Conservatism That Can Win Again. And we want to thank especially the Student Brown Bag Committee for um, co-hosting and, uh, and inviting us here uh, and sharing it with us today. So thank you, MK, and for all the organizers. Um, it's a pleasure to work with you all. Uh, David Frum is the author of five books, including two New York Times bestsellers, The Right Man, The Surprise Presidency of George W. Bush, and An End to Evil, What's Next in the War on Terror, which he co-authored with Richard Pearl. Frum is a resident, at the, a resident fellow at the American Enterprise Institute and writes a daily column for the National Review Online. He contributes frequently to the editorial pages of the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal, as well as to Great Britain's Daily Telegraph and Canada's National Post. He appears regularly on CNN, Fox News, and the BBC. In 2001 to 2002, he served as a speechwriter and special assistant to President George W. Bush. So he has some uh, unique experiences and perspective to share today. Um, his book uh, lays out some very interesting ideas, and I hope that uh, you all will feel free to ask questions. He uh, makes some very interesting points and shares some ideas, including um, the notion that the Republican Party should be the leader on environmentalism and uh, universal health care. So with that, uh, please welcome David Frum. Ronnie, thank you, and uh, Travis, thank you. Um, I think uh, in this center of uh, uh, political study and the connection between academia and government, I think I would be very nervous about suggesting that my experiences in government are in any way unique. I, I think uh, that we are surrounded um, by people who have uh, done, done more and served longer um, and probably under much more difficult circumstances than, than I can lay claim to. But um, I thank you for those, those kind words, and I'm delighted to, to meet you all um, and uh, uh, to be again in this um, amazing uh, institution. Uh, and uh, I, we're just looking at over the, uh, the, uh, through the windows at the ri rise of the University of uh, Texas Stadium, which is uh, – because the, the, one, the one thing clearly you don't have enough room for at the University of Texas is football fans, and <laughs> you need more room for more football fans. Uh, it's conceivable that not all of you are Republicans. <laughs> <laughs> so if any of you are going to, those of that, that small group of people is going to have to forgive me if I talk about this book from the point of view of an insider. This is a book. Um, that is written, I mean, I, don't, I, I obviously am perfectly happy to have non-Republicans read it, but it is, it, it, uh, it is a book written from inside, the par from inside the party, about the party. It's really about, a, because it's really about a distressed organization and uh, trying to remedy, uh, trying to remedy a distressed organization that is very important to me and has been an important part of, of my life. Maybe the way I can most usefully, though, for those of you who are approaching this as an academic matter, address this, is by giving you a, sh my, a short take on what I see as the recent political history of the United States and how we got to be in the situation we are today, and then why this creates special difficulties for the Republican Party, and then very sh I will do a very brief summary of what I think should be done about it, because um, those are the ideas that I've written about, about in greatest detail in the book. Uh, the, um, we have lived since the middle 1970s in a period of Republican political dominance. As you know um, from your studies, it's often said that the United States has a one and a half party system, with at any given moment one party being the stronger party. That's a little bit of an exaggeration, but it's an exaggeration that contains much truth. Uh, through most American political history, there, there have, there's usually been a party that is better connected to the American majority than the other. Um, from the 1890s to the 1920s, that was the Republican Party um, in the aftermath of civil war and industrialization. From the 1930s until the social tumult of the 1960s, that was the Democratic Party, the New Deal Coalition, or Frank Franklin Roosevelt. And since the middle 1970s, the late 1970s, it has been the Republican Party, the Nixon, Reagan, Gingrich majority that didn't win all the time, but won more often than not. Now, this, is, this experience has been the life-forming experience of my generation of Republicans and conservatives, that generation uh, 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 a little bit um, of my own and a little bit above me. I think it has perceptibly been coming to an end since the late 1980s, and to un so late 1990s, I'm sorry. And to understand why it is coming to an end, you have to know why it began. 
Uh, we, there are all kinds of books in the library about the rise of the conservative movement, the rise of conservative success. I, I think this is a completely mistaken way to think about the recent political history of the United States. It, what happened in the 1970s was not that conservatism rose. It was that liberalism collapsed, that the New Deal liberalism that had been so dominant in the 1950s and 60s found itself inadequate to a whole series of new challenges. Um, the, 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 um, the world changed, the economy changed, American social life changed, uh, so the, then the country was hit by a series of, of crises, uh, both at home and abroad, and the uh, New Deal liberalism that came to its apogee in the pharaonic ambitions of Lyndon Baines Johnson, it just could not cope. And, th and the New Deal political coalition, the voting coalition, then broke apart, piece after piece, broke away from the Democrats uh, to, vote for, uh, to vote for the Republicans. One of the starkest examples of this, for example, is, the area, um, is an area called South Boston, uh, which is the area where the Kennedy Library is situated across the bay from downtown Boston. Uh, this is an area that voted more than 90% for John F. Kennedy in 1960, voted more than 90% for Lyndon Johnson in 1964, and voted overwhelmingly for Gerald Ford in 1976 and for Ronald Reagan in 1980. That this very working class, not prosperous area, um, so massively switched polarities from one party to the other. And you all know your American political history, and you will understand and will have your own theories about why that is so. But that, that was an example of the kind of breakaway that happened. Um, urban ethnic neighborhoods, um, much of the South, especially the suburban, the new South, the rapidly growing South, um, other areas as well, different constituencies broke away and moved from the Democrats to the Republicans. Now, since the 1990s, um, a lot of the preconditions that gave rise to that Republican success have one by one begun to disappear. Um, in the 1990s, for example, the Democratic Party, which had in the 1970s made itself economically unacceptable to moderate-minded middle-income Americans, moved in a more entrepreneurial, more pro-business way and made itself less unacceptable. Uh, that the uh, many people who had been frightened by the Democratic Party of Jimmy Carter and of Walter Mondale, the Democratic Party that advocated protectionism and uh, dramatically enhanced trade unionization, found themselves very comfortable with the Democratic Party of Bob Rubin. Uh, that, was, uh, that was a comforting party, and it was obviously also a party that delivered very considerable prosperity in the 1990s. So that source of Republican strength began to go away as Democrats made themselves less unacceptable on the economy. Uh, as the United States moved into a less, into a more benign international environment with the end of the Cold War, the traditional Republican advantage on national security, that also began to fade. Uh, other, in many years, the success of a number of Republican public policies had the effect of allaying a lot of Republican issues. For example, in the year 1990, there were about 26,000 homicides in the United States. By the year uh, 2005, there were about 16,000 homicides in the United States. This plunge in the homicide rate, which is a symptomatic of a broader decline in the crime rate, had the effect of very understandably making Americans a lot less worried about crime. Uh, well, in the 1970s, crime had been issue number one you know, on the American consciousness. In fact, 1974, it was literally uh, the top issue. Today, it's not on the top 10. People don't worry about it anymore. And as a result, they don't look to the political parties to solve it, and so it no longer matters that, the Demo that they regard the Democrats as worse on this issue and the Republicans as better. Uh, so these are the kinds of, of, of changes in the political situation. There are deeper trends demographically. Um, the Republican Party has been the party of um, a certain type of person, a certain kind of voter. I mean, if we can ask objective questions about your age, your race, your sex, your marital situation, your income, your level of education, and that will predict probably whether you're a Democrat or Republican. Well, the Democratic groups have all been growing faster than the Republican groups have. The number of people, for example, who are never married is growing faster than the number of people who are married. The, number of, uh, the proportion of people who never have children has doubled in, uh, in the past quarter century. Uh, the, people, the percentage of people who define themselves as secular has been, um, has been racing. Uh, you often hear it said that Islam is the fastest growing religion in the United States. It's only because the people who do this work don't count no religion as a religion. Um, if you counted that as a religion, no religion would be the fastest growing religion in the United States and by a considerable margin. 
Um, you see a growth through immigration, a growth, growth of the people who are at the bottom of the income distribution, and then through upward mobility and technical progress, a growth of people at the top of the income distribution, both of them growing at the relative expense of the middle, which is where the Republicans live. In the same way with education, you see a huge increase in the percentage of people with post-BA education. We also see, again, because of immigration, a huge, a big increase um, in the number of voters with very little immigration and the education. Those are, again, the two demo great democratic uh, dumbbell constituencies on either side of the, income, of the education distribution. Republicans who do best with people with four years and only four years, uh, that, that group is, again, under pressure. Then finally, um, there are the m most recent events of the past, of the past administration. Um, and this, I think, has a special impact on the voting behavior of people um, in their 20s. Uh, we know that people, that people, first-time voters make assessments of the success or failure of the first presidency they know, and that has a tremendous lifelong effect on their voting behavior. Uh, though the, uh, the Reagan cohort, the, Ronald Reagan in 1984, won voters in their 20s by 20 points and first-time <coughs> voters by a little more than 20 points. And that Reagan cohort remains to this day the most Republican cohort in the electorate, the people who turned 20 between 1985 and 1990. Uh, they formed a negative assessment of the presidency of Jimmy Carter, a positive assessment of the presidency of Ronald Reagan, and they remain strongly Republican. In the same, conversely, among Democrats, you see that the most Democratic cohorts of the electorate have been those people who turned 20 in the late 1940s and those people who turned 20 in the early 1970s. Similar kinds of verdicts. Well, um, the verdict that uh, many Americans have formed on the Bush presidency has been a strongly negative one, and so no surprise, the generation that came of age during the Bush years has been a strongly Democratic uh, cohort. Uh, not, by the way, strongly politically liberal or ideologically liberal, interestingly enough, but strongly democratic. And that um, has this, it's a big generation, and that has a lot of implications for the Republican Party down the road. So this longer term history, these demographic changes, um, this recent experience created a situation with the Republican Party that is very, very difficult in the years going forward. Not to, I'm not saying it's impossible, because one thing that, um, as I watch this, uh, this recent Democratic primary race, one thing you always need to take into account is the possibility of direct divine intervention in the American electoral process on behalf of the Republican Party. And, uh, and it looks like it's happening again. So that, but it may, it may, it looks like a miracle, but it may not be a big enough miracle. I mean, we don't need a burning bush miracle. We need a parting of the Red Sea miracle. <laughs> and, and, and this is, so far it's looking more like a burning bush scale miracle. Uh, uh, but whatever, whatever happens in this particular cycle, the, these, these difficulties of the party are going to persist. Um, one of the things I address very much in, in Comeback at the opening of the book is a claim that many of my Republican friends would like to believe, which is that the reason we're in trouble is because we have not been true enough to our principles, that if we had been more free market, more principled in our uh, uh, opposition to government, uh, more, uh, more vigorous on things like uh, school choice, we would be doing better. Uh, the, the, our problem was we have betrayed our own principles. I call this the English theory approach to politics, that if people aren't understanding what you're saying, just say it louder and slower, and then they'll get it. Um, but all the evidence I was able to collect suggests that this is not true. This is not true, that, um, that the conservative hour uh, has been ending in America because the problems that conservatism was a solution to have been going away. It wasn't that Americans had this highly ideological demand for less government. Uh, Americans don't think that way. They're, this is not an ideological country. Americans accepted less government as a solution to the 1970s problems of slowing productivity growth and high inflation. And less government than what there was in 1978 seemed like a good solution to that problem, which indeed it was. Now it's been done. That doesn't mean that, that they think it's, uh, I had a headache, I took the aspirin, and therefore I'm going to take aspirin every day forever, whether or not I have a headache. They had a, they had a, a problem, they took the medicine, medicine is, is absorbed, the problem is gone, now they're on to new, new kinds of issues. So we are going to need, um, I argue in the book, a, a different kind of approach that begins from the problems of today and works forward. One of the really pernicious legacies of 
um, the politics of recent years. Um, and this is, I don't blame Karl Rove personally, but this is a, a style of politics he was identified with. And thanks to the fact that we all now watch these political chat shows and so none of us are civilians anymore, everybody's a pundit, we all tend to think this way. We tend to think of the, elect, uh, of the job of politics as being one of putting together a political majority, and you put together a political majority by starting with all these little different demographic mosaic tiles, and you see if you can assemble them into a pattern that adds up to 50 percent. Um, I'm suggesting that maybe we need to think about politics in a, in a different way. Start with the problems. What are the important problems of today? Then revert to your principles uh, and say, within our principles, how do we offer solutions to these problems? And what is on Americans' minds right now are, um, I mean, th at the moment, there, there are some economic worries, but that comes and goes with the bigness, business cycle. On a deeper s scale, Americans are worried about um, their, the health care problem, which is ha having such an impact on middle class incomes. The average, work, the median working person is no better off in the year 2006 than they were in the year 2000. Very concerned about an apparent slowing of upward mobility and feelings that the American, uh, the American uh, economic system is not delivering as rewards in a fair way. It's um, not top of mind but back of mind anxiety about the environment. Um, meanwhile, there is dwindling anxiety about a lot of the social issues, um, especially those having to do with family structure that has been so important to the Republicans uh, in the past. Uh, there, and there is, uh, I think, going to be growing concern about America's place in the world as the competitive pressures from China intensify and as America's traditional allies become weaker and weaker, relatively speaking, um, which is something that is very hard to see failing to happen. Um, but the decline of Europe and Japan, I think, has already rapidly begun. It's hard to see how um, it is averted. It might be slowed. And that creates a new kind of political map. And those are the things for which uh, a modern conservative party needs to offer remedies. Very quickly, um, the remedies I offer are, um, I think the party needs to rediscover its environmental heritage. I mean, almost every major piece of environmental legislation on the books in the United States was signed by a Republican president with one or two exceptions. I think uh, Superfund is probably the most important exception. Um, that's part of the history, um, and it, is, it, it can be modernized and adapted. Um, I think the party needs to deal with the problem of middle class incomes um, by talking about measures other than tax measures. Between 1970 and 1980, the tax rate on, a, on the median family doubled from a little bit above 20 percent to a little bit above 40 percent. So when Ronald Reagan talked about tax rates in 1980, he was talking about something deeply meaningful to people, um, part of their experience. Um, that it, today, 80 percent of Americans pay more in payroll taxes than they do in income taxes. And the reason middle class incomes are under pressure is because of the rise in health care costs, not taxes. So you have to talk about that. And that means that the Republican Party has to have its own health care policy. When I talk to Republican groups, they often get a little squirrely at this point because, because when I say health care, they hear state-run, government monopoly, universal health care. And I always say to them, how is it your opponents have so colonized your mind that when you hear a problem, you assume the only possible solution to it is the solution you oppose, and so the only thing to do is not to acknowledge the problem. Um, it reminds me a little bit of what happened in the crime issue, with the crime issue in the 1970s, where many Democrats would then take the view that their principles would not permit them to solve the crime problem. And the American electorate, which is a very broad-minded employer, uh, basically said to the Democrats, we understand your reservations and your compunctions, and we respect your conscientious scruples. If your, if your principles do not allow you to solve the crime problem, that's fine. We'll go hire somebody whose principles do allow them to solve the crime problem. And that is what they will say to Republicans on, on the health care issue if we take the view that I so often hear from Republican groups. Uh, we have to have a modern face on social issues without denying that there are social problems. I mean, it is really true that uh, the spread of the fatherless family formation has big impact on America's hopes to create an equal and fair society. Children who grow up in fatherless households do worse at almost every level of income, and dramatically so, as compared to children who grow up in households with fathers. So this is a true social problem. Not a problem, however, the political system has many solutions for. Um, and so there's a question of whether it's a political problem. But in any case, it is a political problem that needs to be talked about from a point of view of enhancing equality, not from a point of view of punishing people um, who make choices that others regard as improper or inappropriate or immoral. Uh, that's sort of a, a, a quick outline. Let me end with one last note, which is uh, on the foreign policy area. Um, uh, I think that 
there's been some good progress in Iraq recently, and that leads hope to a better outcome to the foreign policy of the past um, half dozen years. Uh, whatever happens in the Middle East, the, polit the international political climate, which was so benign in the 1990s, is sure to become much less benign in the 15 years ahead. Um, even with the best luck in the world, it is hard to see that the rapid decline of Europe and Japan and the equally rapid rise of China is not going to cause all kinds of uncomfortable reverberations. Um, and it's worth remembering that Europe is home to half of the planet's democracies. And in a, in a planet where the, demo, where the majority of the planet's democracies are weakening as world powers, it is hard to imagine how the democratic idea does not also weaken. So this is a, a big problem. And America is going to need a new kind of flexibility and imaginativeness in its foreign policy uh, to address the situation because um, we have all we have all grown up, or almost all of us, unless we're very old, um, in a planet in which we were able to count on a world that was organized broadly the way Americans liked it. Uh, and that may be decreasingly true in the century ahead. Um, and that has, again, some very uncomfortable implications. So that's a, qu a quick tour of, of a book. It's a short book. It's got a lot in it because uh, I, I say to Ronnie that I spent two years writing it and then another year chopping it down from 600 to 200 pages because I wanted people to read it. Uh, so uh, so it's, it's, it's very compressed and a lot of the arguments are a little abbreviated, uh, but I'm delighted to take on all kinds of subjects that you want to ask questions about, and I thank you. Questions? Yes, sir. Um, I was wondering if you'd expand on the, your health care discussion. You say that you know, we shouldn't allow the, the opponent to so colonize our mind that we can only see state yeah. universal health care. What would, I guess, what would be the, the alternative model? Um, the, the alternative model is, um, to work, is to work our way to a, com a true competitive market for health insurance products. Um, and what would you have to do to achieve a true competitive market? Well, the first thing is you'd have to make sure that the purchasers of health care are the actual users of health care. Right now, the purchasers are employers, and, the, the, and then the employees are the beneficiaries. The users are the beneficiaries, but they're not the purchasers. And that is, as we all know, a quirk of the way the American tax code works. Um, it uh, is a quirk that can be undone. And you can't do, undo it. So, it's so big. Uh, a quirk. You can't undo it all at once because a lot of people have built up expectations. But you can progressively um, do things. The president, for example, uh, proposed, I think, a, a, a good tentative first step of um, capping the value of the health care tax exclusion. I think he proposed ten or $15,000, um, which is a little bit bigger than the size. The average health policy for a family of four costs about 12000 So fifteen, you're going to get the most plush policies, and those would it, a larger and larger share of the health care would have to then be paid for out of after tax rather than the for tax dollars, which would gradually corrode uh, the incentive um, to buy it through employers. Some people have gone a little bit farther, like Senator Bennett from Utah, and has proposed a law that would actually require employers to cash out the value of the health care, health insurance they provide employees, and say to them, if you were making $40,000 a year plus a health policy worth $5,000 a year. We no longer provide that policy. Here's five, your salary's just gone up by $5,000. There's some obvious administrative problems here because um, does the company give every employee the same? I mean, supposing I'm running a, a policy that is more generous to some employees than to others, um, you know, how do we do that? But that, that's the, the, that first step is to break the link. Make the user the purchaser. Um, then I think you need to think about identifying anti-competitive measures in the healthcare market. I mean, we don't have a national health care market. We have 50 state markets, each with its own set of regulations. Um, it, it, there's there's um, no national policy. And the policies vary dramatically in cost from state to state by as much as <coughs> six times. Um, some people have proposed addressing this by making policies portable across state lines. I tend to think that's kind of a, a gimmick, because the things that affect cost, um, if I'm in, New, you know, the New, I can observe that a New Jersey policy cost six times as much as the Kentucky policy, but that doesn't mean that that insurance company in Kentucky would be willing to sell somebody in New Jersey the same policy for one-sixth the cost. I think we need to think about shifting the locus of regulation from the states to the federal government um, in a way that makes it possible to have a national, national health care policies and a national health care market. I'm not averse to some of these things, some of the ideas you hear on the Democratic side. Uh, for example, do, um, uh, having policies have some degree of must-sell um, and uh, some system of 
commu community rating. I mean, the idea of, of completely individualizing, it is going to be something to be possible to completely individualize um, each of our ratings. Um, and that has this kind of economic logic to it, except it defeats, um, it defeats some of the social purposes we're trying to achieve. Um, I think I would, just as a last thought, just as a way, whether you agree with where I'm going or not, one way to think about this is to urge everybody to, we, think, we tend to think in terms of the existing programs, Medicare, Medicaid, veterans, native uh, health, um, and, if you th and if you're really economic minded, this health care exclusion. But if you think of them as like one big federal health program, one big pot of money, we're spending in cash dollars about $800 billion a year, federal and state, on health care. Add the value of that exclusion, it's about $190 billion. We're spending close to a trillion dollars a year subsidizing health and policies for certain people chosen in some often quite arbitrary ways. Um, people over a certain age, people under a certain income level, different, different income level in different states, people of veteran status, people who are defined in laws Native Americans and then not others. Um, and I'd like to see us take, move toward taking that trillion dollars and just doing a complete needs-based subsidy, moving toward a national market where most people are, are in the market buying their own health insurance, uh, and then you have a trillion dollars a year to play with to subsidize those who can't afford it. That's a long answer, and, but, and yet probably not detailed enough. I mean, that's, uh, but that's where I'd start. Yes. Um, we were talking about um, giving, I, I think you referred to it as a, the Republican Party, a, a sort of a softer face on mm -hmm. uh, social issues, yeah. maybe a more uh, moderate face on social issues. So would you be, would you be changing what, what we call conservative? I mean, would, would that be the, you know, conservative? And then if that was the case, what would the conservative now? Okay. Well, well, let, let me, um, give more detail about what I, what I mean by that. Um, one of the things that Republicans are broadly agreed upon is that the Roe versus Wade decision of 1973 was bad law. And we're now, there are probably now four votes on the Supreme Court for overturning Roe versus Wade, and probably about 40 percent of America's law professors would think that overturning Roe v. Wade was, was a good idea. Uh, it could happen. Um, if the Republicans do win or uh, in 2008 and 2012, and there are one or two more appointments, it, it could happen. And um, on the day that happens, nothing changes, right? I mean, because what happens then is abortion uh, then becomes a st matter of state jurisdiction, or very little changes. Abortion, once again, becomes a matter of state jurisdiction. Uh, the states then get to pass whatever laws they want on the subject of abortion. Um, states like California and New York uh, could presumably pass pretty liberal uh, abortion laws. States like South Dakota pass pretty conservative abortion laws, but you, uh, it's already true. You can't get an abortion in South Dakota. I think there's maybe one clinic that's open two days a week in the entire state of South Dakota. So they'll, they'll, they won't be open even any, any days a week. But um, that is not going to be a big dramatic difference. The problem, and that's a compromise that the country could probably accept on this issue. The problem is that as a party, we say two things. Our first message is we're going to abolish Roe v. Wade and return to the states. But in our platform since 1980, there's been a commitment to pass what is called a human life amendment. That is to amend the Constitution to define a human being to define um, a pregnancy as a human being from the moment of conception or soon thereafter. So people who are confronting the possibility of the end of Roe v. Wade, who might not see that as a terrifying outcome, then are then left to think, well, what are you really trying to do? You're going to then, you know, you've been talking about democracy and about, you know, judicial imperialism, but now we find that the moment you win round one, then round two is, you're going to then suddenly reverse the argument, be on the other side of the structure of this argument, and you're going to have your own national solution which you're going to impose on everybody. So one of the things I would say, get that amendment, get that plank out of the party platform. Um, make it clear what you're, you know, on these issues where you do have, con I'm not going to tell, a, it's a pro-life party, I'm not going to tell it to stop being a pro-life party, but sh give, pe give the voting majority of the country some sense of how far you're prepared to go and stop indulging very hardline factions with promises that you don't intend to keep, but that frighten everybody else. Um, on the issue of, of um, same-sex relations, um, we've got a similar kind of, of situation. I mean, you can just see the graph about how Americans are becoming more accepting, um, generation by generation. So it's not with the, probably with a compass and a pocket calculator. So with those one of the set of protractors and a pocket calculator, you can probably figure out the date on which the country changes its mind on this issue, and it's probably not that far 
away. Um, and the country, again, will have to come to some kind of compromise on this. Uh, but the Republican Party has a very hard line position that is, um, uh, that is not amenable to compromise and that is increasingly at variance with where the country is. Um, and if you, um, if you just look, um, and f the, the finally, because we have been so indifferent to the economic situation of middle income people, that th those who would like, as I think social science suggests we should, to p look to family status um, as an important part of uh, equal opportunity in the society, and to say that one of the reasons why we're seeing this seeming slowdown it's hard to measure, but the seeming slowdown in upward mobility in the United States and this seeming trend in the United States to have less upward mobility than many European countries do. Family organize, the, the breakdown of the American family is a big part of the reason. And if you're going to focus on that for reasons of upward mobility, uh, you have to also make it clear to the country that this is not an opportunity for some to lord it over <coughs> others and to say that some people are leading good and moral lives and others are leading bad and immoral lives. Yes, sir. Talking about how there's how you would like the Republican Party to move away from kind of Carl Rowan style tactics of kind of working on stitching together a new as the majority social coalition yeah. and more focusing on, you know, solving policy yeah. problems and presenting policy problems to the American people. Um, is there a danger in doing that that in focusing too much on individual policy the Republicans might, you know, lose track of yeah. the majority? Um, and of course, you can't govern and solve policy problems without being the majority. And I guess I uh, especially wonder um, about this scene, as it seems like in, if you look at American political history, usually the party that's in the majority hasn't convinced Americans on specific policy problems, but rather as kind of a broad governing philosophy yeah. that the Americans you know, tend to favor over the other party. Because it shouldn't, if Republicans are going to win, shouldn't they worry about how to figure out what okay. to do that, governing philosophy? That, that's a really good point. And let me. Uh, use that to uh, – that, I think your description of how you put together a majority in the United States is, is right. Uh, the, the, the difference is historically the parties that did that didn't do it quite on purpose. That is, uh, when um, the Republicans of the 1890s said, we're going to take our um, shrinking Civil War majority, or actually it never really was a majority. We're going to take this, but this unstable Civil War plurality, and we're going to then turn it into a permanent modern, you know, 40 year stretch of majority rule. Um, they didn't say, well, okay, now what we're going to do is pick up Slovenians in the upper Midwest. I mean, what they, they did was they, the country had stumbled into this terrible depression um, in the 1890s, uh, and to which the Democrats responded with a series of solutions that looked like they came from the age of Andrew Jackson. And so Republicans said, we are going to offer modern economic management uh, as our solution. Uh, to the problem of the Depression. Some of their ideas were dumb, like protectionism. Uh, others were smart, like the country has to have a proper currency, has to have a proper national bank. That's the right answer to the problem of the gold standard. It's not silver money, it's paper money issued by a national bank. Uh, and they then, as they worked out their ideas, they then found a way, how do you can explain this to millions of people in a society where most people have a great school education? And they then came up with their broad themes, the full dinner pail. I mean, they didn't go into detail about a, a national bank or how a Federal Reserve system would work, but they, uh, they can, they, in that slogan, they conveyed the full meaning. Um, in the same way, I mean, Re Franklin Roosevelt never went to the country and said, uh, my idea is I think water power is the wave of the future. I mean, he had, he had his way of sort of summarizing. In the same way, we need to do the same thing. Um, and the broad theme uh, that I, I lump, would lump all this under is moderate, enterprise-oriented government uh, designed to protect America's uh, p supreme position in a world that is becoming less and less hospitable uh, to the United States. That's and I would then think about some kind of slogan to cover all of that. But here's, but here's, here's the problem, though. When you start with the kind of this micro-targeting politics, uh, one is, A, you can guess wrong, as Karl Rove did, that his big idea was we hold on to our traditional base with the tax cut. We add evangelicals through all of these religious um, outreach programs, and then we're going to do a big amnesty and pull in Hispanics. But his calculation was simply wrong. It didn't. The math never worked. That's not when the Republicans finally got a majority in 2004. That wasn't how they got major the majority. They got it by squeezing the last little bit of lemon juice out of the um, old Nixon, Reagan, Gingrich majority because of the war on terror. Uh, they, and 
uh, and then and, and then it immediately fell apart the moment um, the intense public involvement with that war ended. Um, and then the negative trends, which had been palpable since the 1990s, began to reassert themselves ever more vigorously. So one, it was wrong. But the second is, uh, Got quality of government is really, really important to determining how people perceive you. I mean, if, if, if being a moderate modern party is important and the Democrats discovered in 1990, bat, you know, to, to their cost in 94 and then to their benefit in 96, 98, that it is important, you have to deliver results. Um, and that means you have to begin with, with what the problems are. Another great Texan, Sam Rayburn, uh, used to say that he used to have this policy when he was Speaker of the House that he would never talk to freshman members of Congress. Uh, because he would it was a waste of time. He said, the American people will elect anybody to anything once. <laughs> uh, it, the second term people, then you could talk to them because they'd been reelected and so their people had taken their, their measure. And it's, so it's not so hard to get elected. It's very hard to get, to get reelected and then to get reelected for a third time. And if you want to do that, you have to deliver results. Yes, sir. I'm wondering, looking at kind of going back to, you know, Rose stitching together of all these different constituencies and how that plays in with kind of the, the big figureheads of the conservative movement, uh, the, you know, the radio, the radio talk show hosts and the television pundits yeah. and the James Dobsons and, and kind of the, the stuff that you're outlining, I don't see those groups oh, no, be total anathema. At yeah. all. And how do you reconcile well, I, I, I don't reconcile them. What I would say is, is it's very important to understand that Rush Limbaugh and Sean Hannity have a different goals and a different definition of success from whoever is the Republican candidate for president. Um, and you've, you've seen a lot of indications of that in this year where repeatedly those radio talk show hosts have said, we'd be better off if we lost. Um, and that, that the, what they say, what they, what they then explain, well, we lost in 92 and we, got, we did well in 94. We lost in 1976 and we had a good election in 78 and a great election in 1980. Maybe it'll happen that way again. Um, and maybe it will. Maybe it will. Uh, maybe it's also 1980 in reverse, where if you lose in 1980, you then don't come back for a long time. Uh, but there's no doubt that it's good for them. It's very good for them. Uh, that uh, radio, uh, uh, listen, the, the listenership goes up and your audience is more agitated when your party is out of power. Um, and, you, and so they, are, they represent something a little bit different. I mean, there's, and one of the things I say in the book is that conservatism there too, is, is a governing philosophy, but it's also a form of entertainment. And, <laughs> and we need to recognize that the interests of these two things are not the same. Not the same. Uh, Rush Limbaugh and others benefit when the country is in a state of agitation, when it's divided. I mean, when, when uh, you know, uh, I, I lived in New York during the Dinkins years, and any time there was any kind of act of uh, racial abrasion between you know uh, African Americans and Koreans, or I mean, it was it sold papers for the New York Post, it kept the radio shows going. What, it, was it good for the city? No. Was it good for whoever happened to be the incumbent that was trying to get reelected, whoever that person was? No, it was terrible for them. But it was great for this industry that um, thrives on political entertainment. So we have to be very careful about letting the, the entertainment needs of the conservative base distract us. I mean, Rush Limbaugh has an enormous audience. Enormous. 30 million people. Incredible. That leaves 270 million over. Uh, and uh, and that, it, the electorate, that still leaves there going to be a, probably 125, 128 million voters um, in, this, this time around. So you know, there are 90 million voters who don't listen to a show. Uh, and we have, to, uh, we have to remember them, too, and not, not get so distracted on that. Um, and you know, I think one of the things we saw in the primary season was that Republicans sort of understand that, that, they underst that the party sort of groped its way. I mean, I was a Rudy Giuliani guy, and he was, um, I, I worked on his campaign. But uh, he turned out in 2008 not to be the candidate he had been when he was mayor of New York in 1993 and 1997. Um, the party groped its way to a probably the electorally anyway best answer. And it did so over the objections of all of the people, almost unanimous objections of people on the radio. So, you know, that, that suggests something about the wisdom of crowds. Yes, sir. You're proposing a party of, of, of ideas, a party that, that solves problems. I mean, you spent time in Washington, you 
and spend time with politics. How many people do you actually have you actually encounter that care about solving problems as opposed to really building power? Um, there's a cycle uh, in politics. Uh, my friend Bill Crystal has this wonderful line, so the great thing about being out of power for a political party is you attract a higher class of young person. Uh, and so there's this, there's this cycle, and I, I've lived through this in the Republican experience, which is uh, the, the Republican Party of the 1970s gets more and more upset about what is going on in America, becomes more and more De uh, eager to gain power, more and more eager to right what, is, what it sees as wrong, more and more unhappy and alienated. And then it invests enormous resources in developing a series of ideas. Um, and the conservative side in Washington in the 1970s was a firm, I mean, they weren't all good ideas, like urban enterprise zones, remember them? They turned out to be a terrible idea. But there's still, I mean, a real idea with real social science behind it, real research, real data, um, and, uh, and then they were, and they were given the reality test, and then it turned out, no, it wasn't high taxes and regulation that were responsible for the economic problems of inner cities, it was crime, pure and simple, fix that, and everything else falls into place. Uh, then, um, on the strength of those ideas, you win power, and then, then, again, in that first surge, there is a tremendous interest in ideas, not as intense, maybe, as it was when developing the power, as they begin to be implemented one by one, um, and then tremendous effort to overcome the friction of reality, and then, if they work, then you get reelected, and then it all subsides, and then you move from being, you know, the uh, party of 1981 to the party of 1989. You move from being the Republicans of 1995 to the Republicans of 1999, and the energy goes out of you. And meanwhile, your opponents are going through the converse experience, um, and they are getting hungrier, and they're getting smarter, and they're doing uh, policy work, and then they get their their moment. Uh, now, the inherent advantage that the Republicans have in this cycle is that the Democratic ideas tend not to work. Um, so uh, so that, that, that means that the thing, when they get their chance, things then tend to go very, very badly, uh, very quickly, and so you get a chance to come, come back. And that's, uh, that, I, I, that may be part of the cycle this time. But I think in politics, um, when we're making observations about politics, Every, everything one says is true, and everything one says is true only up to a point. And both the idealistic view of what goes on in Washington and the cynical view of what goes on in Washington are, are both partly right, but both less than fully right. I mean, ideas do matter. They really do. Um, but they're not the only thing that matters. And, um, and oftentimes, maybe the art of politics, um, if you're a true idealist, is to figure out some w ways to mobilize the support of the cynics, of whom there are always um, a large number. Yes? You're speaking to Obama and the Hillary losing, needing to worry about losing the working class white vote. Yeah. And I was wondering if you could speak to that or how you propose they get it back or if it's too late in the game at this point. Well, uh, Hillary's been doing well. I mean, with the working, it's, it's, it's the most astonishing thing. Ever, I mean, the, the idea that she, of all people, would develop this amazing affinity. Um, and, and there's this question of is it something that she's doing or is she just the, the person who happens to be there when. Um, Obama ran into this set of this spot of trouble. Uh, you know the the states where, where this has been the biggest issue, Ohio and Pennsylvania, have been states that are under real economic pressure. And that statement of Obama's about um, where he sort of psychoanalyzed the voters um, and said that they are um, turn basically they're turning against me because they're under economic pressure. Would I think? contain some truth, it would have been a more attractive statement had he also then said, and my plan for relieving their economic pressure is X or Y. The fact that he doesn't have much of one raises a question about it. Uh, but you know, there, there, there are economic and cultural factors that go into a vote. People cast votes for all kinds of reasons, sometimes that, that, that are poorly expressed even to themselves, um, where they can't fully articulate it. But there, there's, there's uh, um, I, issues of identification, there are issues of a sense of belonging, a sense of being understood, a sense that someone, in, with, on issues that are going to come up in the future that aren't on the ballot today, that in, the, in those, on those hypothetical issues, this person can be trusted to do what you would like them to do, and what is in your best interest. Um, so these are all, these all lurk there. Uh, and I think one of the, one of the things that, um, I mean, Obama was given these, this tremendously damaging opportunity. 
the, the opportunity was the, the Reverend Wright statement. And the opportunity was a chance to use that to make a connection, to make this cultural connection. Now, uh, although that speech is generally regarded as a masterpiece, um, I, I think it was a terrible tactical error because he did not answer the question that people were wondering. He did, and nor did, meaning, and the sure sure something you answer the questions that the question goes away. Um, and I, I keep comparing that speech to, uh, I mean, the question is, did you with your little hatchet chop down the cherry tree? And the answer is, um, I need to give you an hour long speech about trees and hatchets and human beings. Yeah. And, and I, I just want a simple, I have a simple question. Your hatchet, did it cut down that tree, yes or no? And so the question for Obama was, how could you sit there? Well, this man said these things. And I defy anybody in this room to give me a one sentence paraphrase of what his answer to that question was. And so that question is, is still left. Well, I don't yeah. think there is a possible simple answer to that question. Well, then, then he sunk. <laughs> First, what you can start with, uh, a James Cone. That's not easy theology. That's really hard to yeah. understand and grasp, even for a PhD in theology. So, like, what do you do? Well, here, here's the simple. Actually, there, in, in, in what you just said, there is a simple answer. I didn't disagree with it enough to do anything about it. But that's still. Okay. The, the point is, the, oh, is there a simple winning answer? Is there a simple answer that people well, would say, okay, okay. N what? Well. What is that? What, how could you sit there when this person said these things? That's the question America has about him. And he's either going to come up with, a satisfa with an answer that reassures people that, say, that what everybody fears is the answer is, I didn't disagree with it enough to, to leave. So he has to come up with, I disagreed with it really, really strongly, but I didn't leave. And, you know, and right, I mean, that's, yeah, there may not be a good, honest answer, but then he sunk because it, it's really people, I think, they're, they're, they're crucial, that, that, that voting block we're talking about don't, doesn't want a president that sits there uh, calmly when his country's insulted. Can you speak for a moment about your vision for the uh, future, I guess, your vision for Republican environmentalism and how that will work? Yeah. Um, uh, one of the things that is really uh, striking when you um, look at uh, the um, statistics on how people vote on the environment is that I expect to find that environmental uh, concern was most concentrated at the top of society, uh, the wealthiest and the best educated. In fact, it turns out it's concentrated at the bottom. And that, I think, that has, it has some very fascinating implications. What it tells me is that while people, I mean, it can tell, it tells me a lot of things, but one of the things it tells me is that when people who are well-educated and well-off talk about the environment, they mean the planetary environment. Uh, they mean biodiversity, they mean global warming. But when people at the bottom of society uh, talk about it, they mean my environment, the immediate, what it's like right around me. Um, the, this, this road that used to be two lane that you could cross without getting killed, it's now six lanes and you can't cross it without being killed. Or uh, the, the garbage dump is getting uh, too big and the trucks are rumbling at 24 hours a day uh, on, and waking everybody up on their way to the garbage dump. I've got a series of things that really impinge on, on my life. And there is a, um, there, you can, I think, begin to think about um, a series of very concrete, immediate, direct quality of life issues um, that have a direct bearing on how people live that have to do, for example, with, with um, way, the way roads are built and zoning is done. And a lot of this is most relevant to Republicans at the state and local level. But uh, to a great extent, we have allowed ourselves to become the party of real estate development. Um, and people like real estate development. They want to have houses, but they, they also want some respect for the consequences for them. And what we tend to do is we tend to be very good. America tends to be increasingly good at developing in a way that for the very well off minimizes the negative consequences of development. Not so good for people in the middle and the bottom. And that, um, that is something that I think uh, as, as a party of the self-conscious middle, um, Republicans can um, can take a voice on. I think on an issue like uh, global warming, I, I actually believe that in general, parties of the right have, have a certain inbuilt advantage on that question. And it is this, that voters dislike fanaticism. And I think it is, I, I'm very struck by the fact that when, when the voters decide they, that welfare needs to be reformed, they give the job to a Democratic president, not to a Republican president, because they think the Democrat, the Republican wants to do this too badly. 
Um, he is going to go way beyond what is strictly necessary to do, uh, and because it's going to be an ideological adventure for him. Uh, and, well, in, in the same way, I think when people, you know, think about these problems like global warming, they want to know, okay, I, okay, if it's a crisis and if we have to do something, then let's do that thing that we have to do. But let's not get carried away. And if you've got this whole other cosmic agenda. Um, we're not going to trust you with responsibility. And so David Cameron in Britain has been discovering that he's doing better on the environmental issue uh, than labor in Canada, um, that Stephen Harper, the progressive conservative leader, is now, or they don't call him that, the conservative leader, um, is now the politician most trusted on the environmental issue. Um, I, so I, I, I think I can perceive a pattern here, a possibility for parties of the center right to say we're going to do what's necessary, but not more. Yeah. I mean, beyond saying that uh, sort of the, in the natural realm of them not overstepping their bounds, um, you talked about the importance of uh, you know, the Republican Party saying here the problem is the solution. Yeah. What is the solution to the global warming the solution? Problem? The solution to the global warming problem is, um, is a carbon tax rather than cap and trade and rather than um, trying to change people's behavior by directly intervening in their, in their lives. Um, if you make, uh, if, if you tax, um, if you tax, uh, if you put a tax, you can't do it right now because energy prices are so very high. But if you put a standby tax that says when the price begins to fall, as it will, um, that there is going to be a tax on emission of carbon, or you can do it by BTU. I mean, there's some uh, technical debates about which is the best modality for this thing. But the tax is going to be inserted at this floor. Um, and so everybody has to make their plans accordingly. And one of the ways that we as Republicans are different from Democrats is we don't look at this as a revenue source that we're going to pledge that every dollar we get from this tax um, is going to be used to offset other taxes. And ideally, to, in fact, to eliminate entire categories of taxes because voters don't trust you to reduce a tax and have it stay reduced. But if you say the tax is going to be reduced to zero, um, that's a pledge that people can understand and check continually as to whether you're, you're honoring it. Um, uh, it's transparent. Uh, it makes sure that, uh, uh, that you get markets involved to find the, the appropriate kind of solution. And it gets us away from what we're in danger of doing now, which is we have direct government investment in the development of new motors, billion and a half dollars spent by the Clinton administration, another billion and a half dollars spent by the Bush administration. And of course, it hasn't been successful. Government um, development, technological development never is. Um, and it gets us away from the extreme market manipulation that is inherent in a cap and trade system. Uh, one of the difficulties in the cap and trade um, is you grandfather in the rights of all present carbon producers. Uh, so you create tremendous barriers to entry in every industry. That is, if you're already in the utility business and you're emitting 5,000 units of carbon, you we cap it, but we give you for free uh, the right to continue to emit those 5,000 units of carbon. Uh, and whereas if we tax you, you and anybody who starts a new utility has to pay the same tax as somebody who's got an old utility. One last one and then, yes sir. Um, the MSNBC polls last night talked pretty huge numbers about uh, Obama supporters and Clinton supporters either voting for Senator McCain or not voting at all. Which yeah. Is kind of a, you know, a big, a big problem that Democrats have always faced. Um, how does John McCain in the general keep those folks that seem right yeah. now to say that they're going to vote for him? Yeah, I worry a little bit that a lot of those things that are expressed in the heat of a contest may, may fade. And that, I mean, we, we have se we, we've seen this, for example, in the Republic there are a lot of people who said when John McCain looked like, was on, I, well, I'd vote for Hillary rather than John McCain. And then when, as it actually comes close to the event, they then rally. So I don't know how much stock I would put in a particular set of numbers. Um, but, uh, I mean, the core of it, I mean, that the, the future McCain ads, assuming Obama's the nominee, uh, the future McCain ads are clips from Hillary Clinton's speeches. Um, I mean, the, 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 and this is the reason that so many Democrats are so unhappy about her, that the ads are all there. Um, she said this, she said that, she said this. Um, and uh, I think just, you know, she is in, may, in many ways road testing the major themes of, of the Obama presidency. Now he's, uh, oh, sorry, of a McCain candidacy. He's going to have to do it, I, I think he's just a, McCain's a more gentlemanly person uh, than Hillary Clinton. I don't just mean that in the gender sense of the term. And uh, he's going to be more reluctant to play at quite as rough as, as she's been willing to play. Uh, but um, I think 
the broad outlines of how he's going to play are, are now visible. Anything else? We'll, we'll want to thank everyone, and a special thanks to David Crumby. You all would help me. Uh, thank you. We always appreciate our. Uh, Authors, but we especially appreciate those whose views are maybe a little different than uh, the majority of those in the room, and so we appreciate you taking. Well, that was through at the beginning of the talk, not well, at no, the end. No, no, no. <laughs> um, and I do want to invite everyone to our future the Republican Party panel tonight at six o'clock at the UT Club. David will be a, a panelist as well as Congressman Mickey Edwards, um, Justice Dale Wainwright, and Solicitor General Ted Cruz, and it'll be moderated by our very own esteemed Professor uh, Paul Steckler. So. Um, hope everyone will count that. David has agreed to sign books out in the lobby. They are for sale, so uh, we hope that you'll pick up a copy and uh, continue the discussion a little bit outside. Thank you. Thank you.